Uh, I have a timer here, so I promise not to talk for more than 10 minutes. Uh, my name is Graham Leonard. Good afternoon. Uh, I work at GNS Science. I make volcano and tsunami hazard maps, and I work with a lot of you around warning response planning. Uh, today, I'm going to briefly introduce to those of you who haven't already been involved the Common Alerting Protocol uh, Implementation Initiative in New Zealand, and maybe a little bit how it might uh, about how it might link to warnings in the New Zealand landscape. Uh, this is a presentation from uh, the Common Alerting Protocol Working Group that started up in December, uh, led by me and Peter Kraft at Met Service, and with David Coutier as a business owner at uh, McDem. Okay, so I will talk through these topics. Uh, what is the Common Alerting protocol, protocol, or CAP, as I'll refer to it throughout from here on? Uh, why CAP? How does it help with warnings? Uh, the working group, the guideline for using CAP in New Zealand that we're in the process of developing, how warnings become CAP alerts, and how we use these with existing and emerging public alerting technologies, such as we just alluded to, alluded to by Minister Kay, for example. CAP is a consistent format. It's, it's not a complicated thing. It's simply a wrapper around a warning message. It's a standard uh, set of headings that your existing warning alert or message can sit within in a consistent way uh, so they can be read in the same way by any public alerting system uh, or a bit of software that picks it up and then translates it for you to read. This allows for automated processing uh, to get them out consistently and especially fast without any delays. Uh, it's been in place in the US uh, quite widely for some years and in p places in Europe and throughout the rest of the world. Um, the challenge is getting consistent behaviour of alerting endpoints across about 30, 30 or more warnable hazards or event types uh, without alerting fatigue. Uh, so when everything's in a standard format and can be transmitted quickly, uh, we don't want to have any delivery issues and we also don't want to over alert. Um, the high priority life safety alerts must be delivered, be readable and be seen and responded to by the public. And that's as much a goal of the working group and our guidelines uh, as the actual technicalities of using CAP itself. So that working group, uh, it's an open working group. We're aiming to support consistent implementation of CAP in New Zealand. Again, this is just a wrapper format to go around warning messages. We're just applying this template to go around warnings so they can be transmitted quickly. Uh, it's led currently by me at GNS and Peter at Met Service, and as I said before, the business owner is currently nominally at McDem, but there's very little resource behind this at the moment, so we're all just doing this as part of our business as usual across these agencies. Our primary activity this year is a New Zealand CAP guideline, uh, and I'll come back to that. Our membership, and please join if you're interested, uh, it really only takes uh, a bit of a passion in this area uh, to, to uh, be qualified to join the working group. If the rest of the presentation doesn't bore you too much, you're the type of person who should be involved. At least one person from each CDM group, and in many cases several, have um, joined up. Most have attended at least one workshop, and more are coming to the one in a, uh, a few weeks. Uh, all of these agencies, I won't read them out, you've probably already read them while I've been talking, uh, have a representative or multiple representatives on the working group. We are working on a New Zealand CAP guideline. So that is a guideline for the implementation of CAP in New Zealand. Uh, the attend intended audience of that guideline is alerting authorities with capital A's. Um, these are uh, people who might put messages into CAP. And uh, the Met Service, through the WMO uh, Register of Alerting Authorities, is actually involved with this in terms of registering official alerting authorities or groups such as CDM gr members of CDM groups as official alerting authorities. So that's something wrapped up in this process. And then also endpoint providers. So anyone providing a technology uh, or uh, a, a, a public education platform that uh, is giving an alert of a, of a hazard event. So that might be cell phone based, it might be siren based, uh, it might be a telephone auto dialer. It might be how this links to an education program about evacuating off an earthquake in a tsunami. Uh, it aims to provide clarity for alerting authorities on how to format and categorize those alerts when they make them as a cap message, and how those alerts should reach the public via uh, the range of al alerting dissemination endpoints that I just mentioned. I'll come back to the, the range of endpoints a little bit later. The, the draft guideline uh, that's 
rapidly in progress at the moment, um, is aimed to be something of a living document. So we aim to have uh, a full draft together and working this year, but regularly revised. It has these sections, how to use the guideline, a range of purpose and scope aspects and governance review. Um, this issue of how we register official alerting authorities in New Zealand with the uh, WMO register. Uh, and then in red, the core meat of the guideline around how to originate a warning so that it's a cap formatted message and uh, how that sits on a hub so it can get picked up by alerting endpoints and how it then gets delivered. Um, specific cap elements, these are these little tag headers you'll see on the next slide and, and how, to how to use those when you're, uh, when you're making a cap message or delivering it and, and how, you, how you use those to deliver it at those endpoints. So the next slide is a little bit technical uh, and the preamble to it is it, it, it's really just showing you the nuts and bolts of cap um, elements, little triangle bracketed headers that are all the different bits uh, of your warning uh, that need to be under each header so that it's, it's readable in the same way throughout. So I'm just going to talk you through those because the guideline gives a little bit of guidance about how you deal with each one in New Zealand. So these are the, these are the elements, the ones in red are, are the, the, the meat of the actual warning message, but everything here is quite important. So who sent it? What area uh, it, it, it's, it's targeted at? So that's geotargeting of alerts. So uh, with CAP, you can be very specific or widespread about where it's going. Uh, restricted lists, so whether it's being used to talk from emergency managers to other emergency managers, as well as the public. Uh, accommodating a range of alerting endpoints. This is a big deal. How do you take something like a, a mobile phone app, which is ri takes rich content, might have, might have a tsunami evacuation map in it or an image, uh, and have the same CAP message usable on that compared to coming through as a text message, which has only got 140 characters. Um, the secret there is probably the headline element. Uh, that's the shortest alert, really. Uh, and if we limit that to 140 characters, most endpoints can read that. We have to make sure everything you need, at a minimum, is therefore in the headline. These three emphasis elements, uh, they're each scaled one to five, urgency, severity, and certainty. Uh, looking at across all of these hazards, how we try and line them up in terms of the behavior of these kind of top five alerting endpoints. And so people, we, people receive and see uh, alerts kind of the same way across the different hazards, the way um, alerting authorities expect them to. And then the, the, the content, what happened and what people should do, description and instruction, and how that links to things like the consistent messaging guideline and, and maybe an update to that. And then a, a range of other details as well. Uh, how long it's effective for, when it was sent, what type of message it is, is it an all clear message, that's very important, when it expires, uh, a code for what we're expecting people to do, uh, what type of event it is, is it a flood, is it a tsunami, uh, do we put a layer in about broadcasting immediately that this uh, has a no delay aspect to it if it's particularly important, and how often should it be repeated for example. Here's an example of a very simple uh, cap form on a web page on my computer and the XML that gets spat out by it. So you can see all of those elements I just talked about formulated uh, into a severe thunderstorm message here. You draw a polygon down here where it um, applies to, you validate it and you press, press send. This sits on a hub and all the alerting endpoints that are CAP compliant are scraping that all the time and they immediately process it and send it out, maybe to a mobile device, maybe to a compliant siren system. Here's an example, uh, at GeoNet, we now have our earthquake alerts fully available on CAP. Uh, if you just type, go to this website through to Quake, you get all the ones in the last seven days constantly updated. So any CAP endpoint can always get earthquakes and you can bring up a specific earthquake by specifying. And here's an example of the flow, and you don't need to look at the detail, but the point is um, a message can go through a complex chain very quickly if it's in a, a common format. PTWC will be giving tsunami alerts in CAP very soon. Currently the official channel is into MCDEM, down through CDEM groups. Uh, in this case we're talking about for Wellington through the Red Cross app, so it goes into the, the Red Cross origination form through a hub, scraped directly into the Red Cross hazard app and goes out to a mobile phone into the public. And it can potentially, if it was automated, go through that whole chain in a matter of seconds. 
or a pre-processed set of rules anywhere along this line can add a message to it and, re and re-originate it, uh, or stop it because it's not above a threshold. Or a human can step in and spend 10 minutes uh, thinking about it before propagating it down the chain. So you can see the advantages of uh, a consistent format, and you can see alternate pathways that might come up. For example, here we're looking at cell broadcast, or a parser that will put it out through SMS. So you can have multiple pathways out, or through a compliant siren system. The green are key alerting endpoints that can receive CAP now, and the orange are ones that are probably coming. Uh, you can see uh, Red Cross app and Google Now are compliant and ready to go for New Zealand. They'll take the messages now. Advertising space automatically gets opened up for this too, which is a little bonus. Uh, cell broadcast is potentially what's being alluded to as an emergent technology this year that may be on the horizon. And with a parser that third parties, for example, CloudM, are rewriting, you might be able to get it to go straight to SMS, your social media and email all at the same time at, uh, in the same way. And a range of other things internationally are also CAP compliant, but not necessarily on the horizon here. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. I see the questions are starting to come. Uh, next speaker will be James Thompson from Canterbury City and Group, and he will be talking about the new Christchurch Justice and Emergency Service precinct. You can tell us more about that. Thanks. Right, um, thank you everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm James Thompson, I'm the team leader with the C regional office of the Canterbury CDM group. And I've been chairing the, uh, the working group looking at the emergency operations centre going into the new Christchurch Justice and Emergency Services precinct. I suppose just a bit of background um, to the centre. Um, it's one of the anchor projects as part of the Christchurch um, CBD rebuild. Um, and it came about through a number of agencies losing their their emergency operations centres and their places where they work from, and each of them starting to look at um, establishing their own new ones, um, and establishing them all as IL4 buildings. And um, it got to the point where it made sense that we tried to look at doing that collaboratively, uh, creating one you know, very strong building, IL4, that we all work from. Of course, recognising the risk that you know, we do need to be careful about putting our eggs all into one basket. Um, a lot of the innovations that I think are that are going to come out of the uh, Justice Precinct EOC are probably yet to be um, yet to be seen, but some of the ones that we are already seeing is what I'm going to talk about today. Just a quick overview of the complex. So, as as the you know the name Christchurch Justice and Emergency Services Precinct says, it incorporates um, the justice function, the emergency services, and um, civil defence emergency management. And uh, building one there is the, is the new courtrooms and the justice component to, um, for Christchurch or for Canterbury. Part four is a courtyard in between. Building two is the emergency service building. So that houses uh, police, fire, St John's, three levels of civil defence, so ministry, uh, region and uh, Christchurch City Council, um, and the Department of Corrections. And then part three is an oper well, building three is an operational um, car park. Another sort of aspect for uh, the development of this came out of the review to the Christchurch earthquakes, the McDem review, that did actually sort of suggest that a single EOC facility be developed um, that could be used by a single agency or all agencies um, as, a, as a way of improving coordination, operational effectiveness. So while the, the McDem re or the review into the earthquakes um, didn't accept that particular um, recommendation, um, we are still building this centre, uh, recognising that each of our TAs, apart from Christchurch, will be with us, will have their own EOCs still, so it doesn't replace the EOCs through the rest of the region. Just a few key facts, um, talked about it being in three buildings and well, five levels. Um, the staff, staff in it's a lot, 1,100 uh, staff with up to 900 visitors per day. And there's 19 courtrooms within in the centre which become an important factor during an emergency in that um, for a large emergency we can expand into those courtrooms and use them for additional you know, task-based planning or whatever we need to do. 
Um, it's resilient, um, 72 hours plus resilience with water, sewerage, power. Um, in fact, it's probably got enough generators to power half of the CBD of Christchurch within it. Um, and those generators are all being put um, out of where it could flood. <laughs> uh, right. So um, as far as Christchurch goes, it is a, it's, a, it's a significant building. It takes up a large, large um, block of Christchurch CBD. So the precinct will house, this is just some of the other components to it, houses the Ministry of Justice, Department of Corrections and Police, and collaboratively they'll use a joint custodial facility. So that's nothing to do with CDM really, um, except for that this has been a, um, a massive cost saving for that, um, that sort of custodial process that police, fire, uh, police uh, St John, sorry, Police Corrections and Ministry of Justice go through. Um, it then brings Police St John's and New Zealand Fire Service together into um, not a joint 111 emergency service um, centre, but co-located um, 111 centres. So that, from an emergency point of view, starts to increase our ability to get that situational awareness of what agencies are actually experiencing during an emergency. It's very quick for us just to go and visit them or get information from them, or at least that's intended. Then uh, the Ministry of Civil Defence Emergency Management, so the South Island Remas, um, the CDM Group Regional Office and Christchurch City Council come together in our own working spaces as well. So our, our business as usual space as well as emergency operations centre space. Um, in particular with the EOC, it's it, like you, I think you'd expect, um, it's designed so that the so-called non-tenanted agencies or all those other agencies that we work with like MPI, health, etc., can come into the centre easily and use it. A few challenges. Um, so for us sort of bringing, um, bringing a, a, an emergency operations centre together, that is providing both an operational role from a Christchurch City Council perspective, as well as a coordination role uh, for a reg regional style emergency um, in, a, in, a, in a combined space while wanting to work together is actually quite challenging. Looking at how we differenti differentiate the roles that need to be performed for uh, Christchurch City Council's role as well as that regional role. So we're working through scenarios and um, as, as um, Norm sort of talked about, uh, the Dr Norm talked about in that last t um, speech around using scenarios to actually develop how we're going to work together and, um, and do this. The other big challenge is bringing um, multiple IT networks together. So while that's a challenge, I think that's also an area for innovation that I'll, I'll talk about later on. But finding, um, you know, sort of innovative, low training needs, um, IT solutions um, is, is, has been an interesting process. Just a graphic artist's impression of the centre. Um, there's a, a floor space down, down below that uh, from a desk seating point of view will take around about 45 to 50 people at the most. We're planning at the moment on only putting 40 desks in there, which is a challenge um, for that, both that regional and um, city council function at the same time. Um, and then there's a, a number of meeting rooms slash working rooms, breakout rooms around the side of the building. The big screen um, was put in as a re requirement at a, um, at a national level through, through, um, through CERA. Um, I think it would be fair to say that the screen won't be as big as this when we actually finally put it in. This would have, uh, if that did go in, it would have been the biggest screen in the Southern Hemisphere, so at um, many, many dollars. <laughs> Having said that, still going to be a very exciting space. Okay, some of the innovations that are starting to come through, so as um, we've got a working group and as it's dealing with um, the process of moving closer to moving in, um, one of the things that the centre has right beside it is a police combined intelligence centre. We're already talking and through the relationships that we've been developing with police that they could see them, um, as long as it works from a staffing point of view, actually providing that intelligence function for us. They've got people that are doing intelligence work full time and for them to pick up uh, doing inte the intelligence process for us during an emergency they feel is something that they could really really do and really bring as a benefit to the, um, to the centre. 
not only that, they're starting to look at um, how they can use their staff to develop potentially our local government staff and other agency staff, so staff from FIRE and staff from St John's as well. Um, so I don't know if you know, but police run a, and if there's any police here, they might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but police run a three-week intelligence course for their staff that go on intel into the intelligence process. They're looking at how they can sort of really, really reduce that down to the bare fundamentals and make a sort of a training package that then we can use to, um, to, to bring our, our teams or our staff up to speed with doing intelligence in a much more effective way. The cross-IT network information sharing, as I said, was a, is a challenge, um, bringing you know, seven or eight networks together. Um, and when we thought, sort of think about the police network and parts of the St John's network, they're protected for obvious reasons, for medical, medical reasons and for the security reasons. Um, and while EMIS is a, you know, is a tool that we can use to help with the situational awareness and bring a lot of information together, how do we get it into EMIS? Um, at the moment I can't sort of talk a lot about the various products that we're looking at because we've got a request for information and an RFP process at the moment. But one of the tools that we're looking at, a little hardware package, um, who, who knows of um, Skype or you know, Skype for Business or Link? So you know how you can share your screens with each other? Um, we're looking at being able to use a product that can do that, but across different people's networks. So rather than sort of being an internal product, it becomes external. Not only that, it also has process flows um, developed into it. So you know, if we've got a particular flow that we need around developing situational awareness, about getting information about what each agency is doing, um, we could build that into the system so that they could put it in, goes into there, and then we could um, probably manually at this stage transfer the final data into EMIS. So that's uh, an innovation that we're looking forward to seeing. The next one is the control of multiple AV sources to the front screen and to other EOC displays within the meeting rooms um, and our public information room, which is a little bit um, separated from the main hall. Um, man, it costs money <laughs> seeing up these things, uh, you know, the cost of them, but the benefits that that brings of being able to um, pick up feeds from almost any source through uh, a desktop on your computer and control that to going up onto a big screen that is able to be adjusted um, will be uh, of huge benefit to us. And the last thing that we're really very keen on is having a very flexible layout in the main hall. We're not actually labelling any of the desk areas as such. We've got ideas about what you know, SIMS functions will be applied in each of those, in those layouts. But we want the layout to absolutely be able to fit any situation that's thrown at it whether it's just police dealing with a, you know, um, a, a planned sporting event and, and the traffic management, uh, right through to, let's hope it never happens, but another Christchurch earthquake or worse. So we've got this flexible, we're looking at a very flexible process that meets the multi-agency need of the centre. Just a, um, this is the latest picture of the construction. Um, so that sort of building um, in, the, in the middle there is the EOC building. It's just uh, finished having glass put in um, on, the, on the two sides and just the long, that longitudinal side has to be finished off. Um, and then um, the eventual plan is that we'll be in there and running the EOC by June 2017. Benefits? Thanks, David. Benefits, um, and that we're seeing this already, the, um, the emergency services and CDM working together on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's been discussed today in other, other presentations about creating that networking. And that networking, um, just through planning how the centre's going to work, is already paying off. Um, a bigger pool of staff, so um, as I said, you know, police bringing intelligence specialists into the EOC. Um, but even to as far as um, corrections, who would normally not have very much to do with emergency management, already sort of saying that they've got an interest in providing staff to help in an emergency operations centre. So it just increases the scope of staff that we can use over a longer term duration. Um, faster situational awareness and hopefully removal of siloed decision making. It's one of the criticisms that came through in the Christchurch earthquake that there was a bit of siloed decision making. And uh, with all the agencies being co-located, um, I would certainly expect to see less of that. 
And I'll just finish with, well, finish this bit with boundary spanning. It's a term that's not used a lot within emergency management here in New Zealand, but really around how do we create those connections, networked connections between this EOC and the Territorial Authority EOCs. And through having more involvement with the multiple agencies, each of those who can potentially have um, liaison officers, if you want, in um, other EOCs, we create this bit of ability to um, boundary span much better. And um, running out of time, but if anyone wants to sort of talk to me more about boundary spanning and some of the research I've done on that, you're more than welcome. I think too, um, it's yet to be seen, um, and the discussion perhaps needs to go further, but just what role the centre may have from a national point of view. Um, it, there's certainly opportunities there for, for that. And I will just finish um, on a question there. You know, are these sorts of centres, and I know a number of other emergency managers throughout New Zealand have come and talked to me around where it's going. Um, is it going to be, um, I suppose, a, a way of the future of reduced numbers of EOCs, more multi-agency connection, and um, hopefully better, faster, and more effective response for our communities? Thank you, James. I suppose next time you can tell us how did it work. Um, I note uh, the questions coming up are very topic related, um, so there aren't necessarily questions that McDem will be able to answer. So I'll, I want to encourage our uh, panel members to uh, keep their finger on the pulse there and offer some comments if they, if they want, perhaps during this uh, session, if not soon afterwards. So Graham has already answered the two cap ones. Thanks. Um, next speaker is uh, Charles Hatchwell from Fire Service. Uh, Charles is the uh, project manager for the, what I call drone project, but uh, there obviously is a smarter name for that. Um, Charles will tell us what that is. Uh, quite a significant piece of work that Fire Service is undertaking, and I have no doubt all of us are very interested to hear more. Thank you, Charles. Right, um, I'm probably involved with one of the sexiest projects in government actually. I'm really fortunate to be part of this. Ken couldn't make it today, he um, tore his Achilles and so therefore I knocked this up at about 10 o'clock last night so I hope I give the service a good service rather than a disservice in presenting this. Um, I, I don't know if you'll remember um, Sir Ray Avery when he was talking about observation is the key to innovation. Would you say that's true? Do you think that's a fair comment? And I think actually in this, that is a good metaphor for what we're dealing with here in the sense that um, I'd say observation is also the key to actually emergency management as well, is that situational awareness. And that's the main thing about this. It's not about the RPAS, it's not about a drone or an unmanned aerial vehicle, it's actually about situational awareness. Oops. Um, so, so the intent is actually a strategic and tactical capacity that enhances operations both present and future. I mean there's actual potential there across multi-agency collaboration and you can see actually just from the size, shape and um, capabilities of these drones you can see cost and benefit right across government and it's actually about integrating that across that and I know in the fire service it's a lot about of that integration of that actual capacity and if you like the actual um, opportunity is enhance our ability to rapidly capture and disseminate accurate intelligence data and increasing safety and efficiency. So if you like, it's all about getting a good understanding of the actual um, situation that you're actually working, walk, uh, walking into. Um, a good example of that was actually Dr. Cord today. I think he gave a, a, a superb example of, I think it was um, situational awareness. And I think that relates to resilience, which relates to this as well. So it's about the guys being more safe in a situation and being able to accurately, actually, accurately understand the situation coming up. So actually, what, what, what's been going on? Um, you'll see that uh, the New Zealand Fire Service has actually been um, dealing with drones in about 2013, they, they purchased one. And the main point about this actual slide is that, I wanna get the, the point across that there's, there's been good work that's been performed and the te technology is actually moving fast. So you can see that actually, um, it's actually moved past 
what we um, expected in terms of like um, going from say $24,000 down to $5,000 in a few years. And so what you're actually seeing is that develop into a much um, more integrated, more fast responding piece of equipment. So it's almost like the old days of the phone and that technology curve when you're, you're seeing for example, um, a video player come down in price and then it turns into a DVD player. So it's exceptional what's actually happening in that space. And in playing in that space, it's actually the decisions that you need to make. When do you actually become a lead or a lag in adopting this technology? And I think that's some of the challenges. Um, if you get the chance, you can look at the actual um, New Zealand Fire Service and see what actually events they actually respond to. And somebody alluded to the fact that it's actually more than just fire, and you can see this from here. What, in, in that period, you're getting about 80,000 um, events or incidents, and they, they all come with their own nuances, and so the difficulty is then picking the right RPAS for the right job. And, and that's actually a lot about this journey as well, is working with other agencies to be able to actually achieve that. Um, if, if you like, you could look at the New Zealand Fire Services actually, maybe the Amazon of emergency services. I think you've got something like um, two, 250 stations, um, 750 to 800 appliances, and it's a distribution network you know, for integration. Um, incredible if you look at it, and the potential there is huge. So I was trying to weave this into um, the four R's. Um, I'm not from this background, actually, so a bit of an imposter in that sense, but just trying to get a sense of, well, what am I trying to actually get across here? And it's a one size doesn't fit all, but how do you make sense of this? So for example, if you're looking at reduction, readiness, response and recovery, just anybody out there, if you could see, for example, where would you fit a drone in those, those particular scenarios or, or the response, for example. And I'll give you an example was LiDAR. That would probably fit in the reduction, the readiness. And this is, this is the attachment that you put to the drone and you can do 3D mapping and that helps you actually prepare for events. So we, we, there, there's a whole lot of nuances about actually understanding the problem, going into the detail, diving back out again. And it related to that, um, the Dr. Cord, um, what if you like, uh, his, his presentation, is, is that going through the spectrum of the detail and then back out into the overview. And this is what it's about, and then getting that integration with other people. So, so effectively, you know, you can forget the fact it's an RPAS, it's a drone or anything like that, but it enables these things, live streaming and stills, which is kind of your bread butter. Um, it's hot stream, um, hotspot detection is if you're in rural environment. You've got mapping 2D, 3D, you've got detecting tracking of substances, and you've got um, communications and accessing inaccessible and dangerous areas. Um, you know, it, it's actually endless. I mean, if, if you think about it, we need to, if, if you're using one of these, it's all about the equipment you can attach to it. So it's all about the platform. So if you have a robust platform that we can use and utilised, you've got something that there can be adapted and um, used in a whole lot of environments. Just want to give you a bit of an example of, I, I think it's wonderful. I think it's from the MOD, and it gives you a bit of a um, like the perch and watch for days. So, so for example, that changes the whole decision-making process about what one you would pick. That can sit there, low energy, not used, sit there and watch sample gases, for example, potentially, um, look out for movement, all these other things. So, so you just get a sense of how do you integrate this all in, and and it's just sitting there waiting to happen. And the price points and the tipping points are actually coming. Um, I thought this would, might be a good metaphor for it. Um, so I was searching around last night and, and I thought this might do the trick for actually, for me to shut up and actually let people comment or watch and watch this video. But there's two scenarios here. There's the land-based view. Um, this is an oil tank in, in uh, um, Appia Wharf in Samoa. And then there's the RPAS view. So um, I could ask the gentleman to play the video, please. I don't know what you're seeing here, but I mean, for me, and for, for um, not an expert, I'm seeing ground-based, slow, limited situational awareness, potentially dangerous, um, people not getting the information quick enough or fast enough. And you could like, if, it, if you want the big picture, little picture, this, this to me is the little picture, isn't it? I, I, it? It helps, but I don't know necessarily it helps that much. I'm not the expert in this space, but um, I don't know how you feel about that.
So is that, a, that enough for everybody to get a sense of that? Right, and if we could actually switch to this view here, just to see what you feel about it. Does it add value? Sorry. Sorry about that. Now, apparently, um, this was put up on YouTube or something, and I think um, the fire surface was contacted, and one of the commanders actually reviewed this footage. So this is not even a, a properly set up system. This was uh, a member of the public that did this as well. So you can see the actual potential here, huge. Could move it along maybe a bit, halfway or something. Right, yeah, I oh, wish you can stop that for us. Cheers. So, what does everybody think of that? So, so is there value in that? Yep, yep, yep sweet. So I was trying to get across with this, this uh, slide here. Um, it's actually, what, what, what's all that about really? I mean, it looks like it's just another boring slide and everything. To me, that's actually Darwinian evolution at its best. And it's human, it is machine, and it's the environment all coming together. And what you're seeing here is you, you're seeing it going from this sort of like primordial soup of say entertainment and recording. Now you're in the kind of protecting, inspecting, and now you're in the ballet dance, and you're also moving into the evaluation and management. Um, it's incredible. So, so if you look at that, that, that's the evolution of technology. And the problem for us is to decide how to use that technology in this space. So if I was just going to let you know what we're doing next, um, we're doing our best to work with other um, partners and agencies, just conversations are starting to happen. We're working with um, or talking with NZDF, the Police, um, Transport Investigation Action Commission and others as well. And so there's some great conversations about actually how we actually choose this, how we utilise it. So that's, that's essentially it. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Charles. Very impressive. We're jumping left to right, but uh, I suppose at this time of the day, change is as good as holiday. Um, next, next up is Mitch uh, Mitchell. Uh, sorry, John Mitchell. <laughs> uh, more affectionately known as Mitch. Uh, about the Controller Development Program. Thanks, Mitch. Thank you, David. So, New Zealand Fire Service and Space Administration. Excellent. It was great uh, just looking around the room and seeing the, the looks of delight while you're watching that video. It was awesome. Um, <clears throat> slightly different level here. For those of us who've been involved in emergency management for a while, uh, you'll understand where some of this came from. The Controller Development Program. Uh, it was initiated in early 2014. Um, there's quite a few people in the room who've been through it, actually. We've had 101 participants through the, pro through the initial two components of the program since, uh, since it started in late 2014. It too, uh, like the, what James was talking about, was a post-quake decision of government that there needed to be significantly enhanced uh, professional development for controllers at local and group level. Uh, there was also a decision made that the SIMS manual needed to be made fit for purpose. Um, so I was involved in that project as well, along with Dave and others. So uh, it integrates the two of those in this program. So what we've come up with, which is quite different from the previous controller workshop training in the past, which was one or two days. It's now six week, at least six weeks online. We give, we give participants a little bit more time than that. We like them like to be quite flexible. Uh, so there's online learning that occurs within that. Then there's one week of intensive residential, uh, which starts on a Sunday evening and finishes mid-Friday afternoon. Uh, and as we've, we've modified the program as we've gone, 
we just had one last week, residential phase, we got the particip participants right into activity the first evening and that momentum continued through the week. It's then followed by a 12 to 18 month uh, uh, self-led development program. Uh, the candidates are supported in that, uh, but it's mostly about them and it's a self-reflective development process. Well, we've had five cohorts uh, since late 2014. So the online component uh, is uh, self-reflective, as I, as I mentioned. It introduces, and many of the participants haven't had much exposure to this before, comprehensive risk-based emergency management. It's not just about what they do in emergencies. It's being leaders throughout all aspects of emergency management, as the Act implies they should be. It's about self and peer assessment. So there's a 360 degree feedback process included in it, uh, and we've now modified how we do that so the, the candidates receive that day one of the residential program. Uh, previously, they didn't get it till later, so that's helped with momentum as well. Uh, that goes out to between usually six and nine of their peers, people who've reported to them or currently do at their same level and higher, and it gives them a very good uh, feel for what others think of them and also gives them an opportunity to somewhat objectively think about where they sit amongst uh, the competencies for controllers. Uh, on the online phase, there's a significant number of leadership case studies that are explored, and there's a lot of very active online discussion about those. Um, and response management case studies as well. And we do look at the Canterbury uh, situation as it turned out, as it transpired, but, and the reviews of that, but we also look at a range of others. We don't uh, intend to only focus on Canterbury at all. We also make sure that uh, those involved have had some exposure to the emergency management plans that relate to their level of operation, and ideally one below and above. It's also a good opportunity for many who've not had exposure to online learning before. Uh, and for lot, quite a few people that's the case. Uh, but that is the way of the future. And um, so we've been using the Ministry's um, uh, learning management system, which is now being upgraded and will be even more effective in the future. Uh, but it's been a useful platform uh, to work from for the time being. Uh, within it, we use um, this the candidates have access to the Open to Study Introduction to Emergency Management course, which is free to anyone who wants to have access to it. And I think you see the numbers on there. That's, um, we set this up at about the same time the controller program started. We, by in about six weeks' time, we will have had 20,000 people sign up to that internationally. Um, and the controllers get to uh, dabble in that as well. So this is what they see in the 360 degree feedback. Um, so this is the overall results. You can see the competencies, uh, relationship management, information management, uh, risk management, planning, implementation, communications, capability development, but really the emphasis of the program is on leadership. That's the key component. Um, so this is the front page of the report. Each of these competencies is broken down in detail. Wherever possible, there are um, we, we encourage them for comments from peers and also self-reflection. It's much more valuable if those are there. Interesting, with the latest cohort, you'd think they were um, sitting a, a postgraduate emergen uh, emergency management paper at university. There was some lengthy peer feedback provided, and most of it constructive. It's very useful stuff. Usually it's more succinct than that. The residential phase, as I said, is uh, essentially five days. Uh, we use a lot of subject matter experts uh, to come in to support that. It's based on essentially three other programs internationally. One, New Zealand Defence Force uh, Command and Leadership College, aspects of what they do there in leadership. Um, the, it's now defunct, but the Emergency Management Australia Institute and their Beyond Command and Control course and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government um, uh, Meta Leadership Program. Uh, so this, this uh, program is done in a partnership with Massey University and Auckland University of Technology. Chris Webb's in the room here, so he's one of those experts that comes in, particularly around the decision making and, um, and some of the leadership aspects as well. It talks about and places SIMS in a local, regional and response. So builds on if they've had SIMS four or perhaps two um, training beforehand that takes it to quite a different level 
uh, was significantly different um, uh, and more often more challenging scenarios for them to work through. And it is linked to the integrated training framework as well for other EOC and ECC type roles. So as I said, there's a range of exercises that we run through. Um, and these have now, we now have a, a, a flow for that rather than distinct exercises. So there's a logic to it. Uh, and we've added a significant component uh, on ethics in response. <clears throat> and there's a lot of active feedback amongst the participants as well. There's some uh, introduction and coverage of uh, legislation and powers, but it's not done in a classroom type setting where they're told what it is. They have context where they have to understand and explore what powers might apply to that context. And they have to initiate their personal development plan. So the ongoing uh, development program is, as I said, between 12 and 18 months. That gives the candidates enough time to be able to, particularly if they want to focus on response aspects of it, to be able to be involved in a significant exercise or from a professional perspective, uh, a, um, a real response. It may be on their patch or it may be on someone else's patch. Uh, there's a mentor program within it, so they're uh, required to find a mentor. We can help them connect that up. It's part of the program that we need to provide some more support to, particularly to the mentors, uh, to make sure that that works. But all of those um, uh, competencies that are in the ministry's competency framework for controllers uh, could be focused on in this program. Usually we'll get the candidates to focus on about two or three of those, the areas that have been ident identified where they'll get the most benefit of developing them further. So they come up with a plan and it's, uh, and it's, not, it's not a coincidence that that development plan is structured very much like an action plan from SIMS. So we encourage people to think about that. Interesting with some of the presentations today, we get them to think about in the exercises where the, the emergency that they're dealing with is likely to go, what are the needs that come from that, and what are the interventions that they should be, able to be leading and facilitating to meet the needs of the community. Similarly with their development plan, it's where do they want to go to, where do they need to go to as a controller, and what are the things that they can do, what are the resources necessary to make that happen. Not many of the controllers have followed through, of the candidates have followed through on that yet, although three of them are, are graduating, uh, two of them will be here tonight and will receive their certificates and um, gold lapel pins. So outcomes from the program though, and we've, uh, so this is feedback we've been receiving uh, in and around the program, there's significantly higher level of engagement of controllers in the business of emergency management and their local authority of CDM group. They have a better appreciation of the role of the other players, particularly the other agencies. We emphasise that emergency management is not a local government function. It is an all of government function, it's an all of community function, and we push that. Some find that uncomfortable. That's okay, that's the business we're in. We need to make uncomfortable decisions and we need to give uncomfortable advice sometimes and be able to move forward as, um, as Norm was saying earlier. Uh, we need to, to make progress. Sometimes we need to do that. So we like to push people out of their comfort zones a little bit. Um, so we're seeing enhanced leadership, particularly uh, between primary and ultimate controllers. Often there was reliance on one person and not so much bringing the ultimate controllers in. Uh, we're seeing much more of that load being spread now, which is great. Um, heightened multi-agency awareness and connectedness at local and regional levels. Now that was happening very well in some CDM groups and local level in some cases, but with the, uh, the impact of this program and other things too, not just this, we're seeing more of that happening now, which is great. Uh, we're seeing controller forums being established uh, around, uh, around the country. Again, we, even where there was good practice, there weren't necessarily those sorts of forums. We're seeing increased controller development within CDM groups, so CDM groups taking responsibility for developing their own people. That's not competition with this program, that's what we want to see happening, so it's great. Um, and we're seeing controllers actively seeking experience in other areas and with other agencies. So the more of that, the better. And we're also seeing increased appreciation of SIMS 2.0. The SIMS manual today, uh, after 2014, is actually quite different in parts from that which preceded it. There's key components that we focus on this program, particularly the intelligence, situation awareness, um, planning, the planning P that's included in there, and the unified control aspect that is not well covered in many other areas at the moment. Uh, we are finding though that for those who come into it there are some who are coming in without adequate functional uh, foundational knowledge so 
there's a bit of a gap that we need to look at. Either we are a little more selective on who we bring onto the program, or really we need to make sure that they're prepared before they get there. So the next cohort kicks off in September with the residential phase in November. Um, so we are, oh, we're not only looking for people from local government and the ministry, we're looking for people from other agencies too. Uh, cohort last year we had two from MPI, Ministry of Prime Ministry and one from the Ministry of Health on there as well and Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and they worked particularly well, so the more the merrier. Thank you. Thank you Mitch and from the controllers to Velvet Leaf. I think all of us are aware of the Velvet Leaf crisis down south, so we have two presenters. David Yard from MPI and Angus McKay from uh, Southland Emergency Management, CDM. Uh, they will tell us how they joined, joined up to actually tackle this problem. Well, thank you, David. Uh, if everybody knows about the Velvet Leaf response, I might as well go home now. So let's hope we don't. Um, as instant controller, I'd, I'd like to talk you through how response develops and how we engage with partners to achieve our aims and objectives. Um, mine's going to be a very short one. I've got five minutes to talk through the work that we've done in three months. So it's quite a challenge. So excuse me if I fly through a bit of rate, but please feel free to ask me some questions. I want to be top of the table by the end of the day. So. Um, on the 18th of February this year, MPI were first made aware of Velvet Leaf, and I'll explain what Velvet Leaf is. It's in a, found in a fodder beet crop on a farm in Canterbury. Um, less than a week later we were notified by seed importers through our 0800 notification number of four further cases. Now certainly one case on its own is bad enough, a further four cases within a week starts alarm bells ringing. And the next day MPI stood up a response. Just to outline, MPI does use SIMS, um, I have to agree with what the gentleman says. We find SIMS extremely functional, we have our single scalable response model and it means that we can bring in people for across government if this escalates into an all of government response. Um, within our response structure we have governance, we place great importance on governance and not only do we have MPI officials but we had representatives from Fed Farmers, Federation for Arable Research, New Zealand Grain Seed Trade Association, Beef and Lamb and Dairy New Zealand. So it's a true collaboration of partners within the response. The aims of the response were jointly to manage the impact of Velvet Leaf on the agricultural industry and to manage trade because clearly trade of seeds is of vital importance to New Zealand and to manage the impact of Velvet Leaf and our response activities on farmers. So we place great importance at the industry level and at the local level on farmers. Now before we go any further, I think it's important to clarify how Velvet Leaf actually got into the country, because obviously as MPI we control the borders. Um, the Velvet Leaf itself came in in pelletised fodder beet. When I say pelletised, it's seed that's coated with a coating, so you can't actually see what's inside the, the middle. I liken it to a, a packet of M&Ms. You buy them as peanut M&Ms, but you don't know whether you're going to get raisins in. Unfortunately, these particular seeds were certified free of contamination by another government department in Denmark. Um, the importers have done nothing wrong, they complied fully with the standards, so there's been a mistake gone somewhere wrong in the system before it reached New Zealand. The seeds were grown in Italy, and as I say, certified in Denmark. So this reflects that we've got a globalised trade that we're dealing with. The weed itself. Um, is a self-propagating weed. It's found widely across Europe, Asia and North America. This is where it becomes quite scary because each seed produces one plant. That's quite good biology. But that plant itself will create 17,000 seeds. If the seeds are allowed to drop, they can last in the soil for up to 50 years. So you'll be quickly beginning to realise this is not a short-term fix. This is a big problem for farmers across the country. The plant itself outcompetes crops for light and nutrients, and it's estimated that if uh, the weeds are allowed to establish, you could be talking 30% of crop losses to farmers. If no action is taken, velvet leaf can establish to large densities very quickly. And to demonstrate this, I've got a, a nice picture. Uh, we also had velvet leaf on a separate incursion from Waikato. Now this is actually a crop, but you can't see the crop for velvet leaf. In the first year there were only two or three plants on that paddock. Uh, in the next year there were 10 to 20,000 and still the farmer did nothing. In the third year that particular farmer extracted two and a half tonnes of weed. 
off the property and was unable to sell their maize crop at all because it was clearly nobody wanted to buy it because it was so heavily infested. Um, when things go wrong, they happen in style. You'll see um, clearly one of your regions will appear here. The seed was distributed right across the country. Worstly affected were Canterbury with 122, Otago with 45 and Southland with 55. And my colleague will talk about the Southland experience in a minute. Um, we immediately moved into an urgent measures phase. Urgent measures are designed to, to limit the, the, uh, the risk to the response, to control and preserve our options. And the initial purpose was to control further spread of velvet leaf. The focus was on seed testing, because initially we suspected there may be one seed line. As you'll see, we now have six separate seed lines that were brought in by the same contractor which means we're dealing with a six-fold problem. And those numbers that you've seen there are only associated with the first two seed lines. So you don't need to be a rocket scientist to say that next year we're looking at potentially three times the multiplication of numbers of problem. Um, so we needed to do a lot of seed testing and to pull the weeds out as quickly as possible. Because for every weed that you pull out before it flowers, it's 17,000 less seeds the year after. So it's a very strong remit for a financial investment quickly and harshly. It's quickly become evident that because of the biology of the plant that national eradication, and by the term national eradication I mean removal of every last plant from the country, is unlikely to be achievable in the short to medium term. And the focus is more about containing the spread and working towards elimination from regions. So those regions that only have one or two farms, with concerted effort, you may be able to eliminate it within two or three years, particularly if you stop the seeding in the first year. However, national eradication remains our long-term goal, but when I say a long-term goal, this is probably not likely to be in my uh, lifetime. So you know we're talking a long-term problem here. To date, over 800 farms have been identified as having received the first three contaminated seed lines. Just to stress, we now have six. All premises were visited by regional councils, representatives from Assure Quality, MPI officials, our National Biosecurity Capability Network, which is an extremely robust and flexible group of organisations that has come together um, who can help us out in terms of response, and volunteers. For each farm that was visited, the position of velvet leaf plants were recorded and plants were pulled. And this enables the farmers to go back and focus next year on specific areas rather than just having to walk all their paddocks. The risk is there may be late emergence, that's plants that are small, so farmers need to remain vigilant. Um, just before I go, I'd like to say, just to keep Charles happy, that MPI are also trialling drones, so it's not exclusive to the fire service. And we're also uh, getting keen interest in people who have dogs with highly sensitive smells. MPI has its own dogs, and we believe this may be a way of assisting farmers by training dogs to go through the paddocks to find these things. Going forward, we're developing farmer support programs with regional workshops, which will enable every affected farmer across the country to spend individual time with industry to work up farm management plans. And this is where industry, the farmers, and everybody else can work collectively to stop this problem. Now, I've ranted on enough. I'm going to hand over to my colleague from Southland, who's going to tell you what he did. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon. Um, Lots of pictures in my presentation, so hopefully you'll stay awake a bit longer. Um, I'm Angus McKay. I'm the Emergency Management Manager for Southland. I'm also the Civil Defence Group Controller. And depending on how the debate goes tomorrow, I might be the Disaster Risk Management Manager. Who knows? So, fortunately, I, I, I came from Auckland, so I'd worked with the MPI before on the Queensland fruit fly. So I had a kind of idea in the back of my mind how... MPI and Assure Quality work, because they're, they're a pretty interlinked um, couple of organisations. So this was an MPI-led response. Um, they have a contract with Assure Quality to do their operational side of things. And Assure Quality have contracts with all the regional councils to do uh, a national biosecurity capability. So it all gets a little bit complicated. Um, basically, in Southland, we have 50% of the crop of fodder beet, and I know more about fodder beet now than I ever thought I ever wanted to know. So 
straight away the biosecurity manager at the regional council and the CE said, look, the priority is we've got to inspect all this crop, all the suspect crop, and we've got to remove the velvet leaf before we get to the situation that's in Waikato, so before it gets mature seeds on it. So really it was all hands to the pumps. Um, we activated our EOC, uh, MPI were running the, the regional response because this was all around the, and the national response, but we, we basically just took the bull by the horns and got on with it in Southland. So here's a typical um, a day out in the field. Um, various guidelines came out initially about how many metres apart you should walk and all this kind of thing. But we thought if it's worth doing this, it's worth doing it well, because we've got one opportunity in Southland to eradicate or vastly reduce the impact of the crop. So fortunately, um, I'm very lucky. I've got a purpose-built EOC uh, operations room. And the other convenient factor is that the biosecurity team share the offices around the, uh, the EOC with, with us. So we have a pretty close relationship anyway. Um, you might think, why is civil defence getting involved in this? And my question to you is, why wouldn't we? You know, we train all the time to do logistics and welfare and planning and tasking and all this kind of stuff. And this is what we were doing for six weeks. Um, under the SIM structure, I've been on Mitch's controllers course, so I know all about it. Um, the biosecurity manager was really the, the controller, if you like, and I was sitting there as the response manager running the EOC. Um, initially from MPI, we got a list of 120 seed holder accounts. Um, didn't mean anything to anybody because seed holders, the account holders could have been in Auckland. They could have one farm, they could have 10 farms. So we actually had to ring everybody up and pretty mammoth operation really. Uh, we produced a pro forma questionnaire and we were asking things like when were the seeds sown because we were trying to prioritise our search. And how many hectares did you plant and what seed varieties did you use? Um, initially with the, um, the Kairos 1 to 8 which is one of the seed varieties we reckon we had about 1400 hectares to do. Um, every farm was different, some of them are really organised, some of them had farm maps that they knew exactly where they'd planted this stuff. Others you'd turn up and they'd told you they'd got two hectares and then the farmer would go, well, actually I think that box of seed, we chucked it in with everything else and that 50 hectares out there could have it in. So you never knew until you turned up how much you had to search. Um, so here's a typical briefing, eight o'clock in the morning, we got everybody in. Um, they were all bright eyed and bushy tailed at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, gave them the briefing, gave them the vehicles and the lunches, and they came back 10 hours later absolutely knackered from walking around the paddocks. This is one of the typical teams. This is the uh, volunteers from Fonterra. They came to the party late on, um, gave us about 10, 15, 20 people. Um, these are the velvet leaf here. Sorry, two screens. These are the best looked after velvet leaf plants in New Zealand. We, we kept them in the EOC for six weeks and use them as an induction tool. So velvet leaf by its name is a really unusual plant. You, you touch the leaf and it just, just feels like velvet. But you can't see that we had three plants. Um, that's one of the bigger ones we've got, ranging down to tiny. Um, after the process all, all the plants were bagged and disposed of in a proved landfill. So here's another one of the teams going out. We had, we had two regional council staff and then anybody else we could find. So Assure Quality were really good locally. They, they brought in a lot of contractors, a lot of other regional council biosecurity teams. We had um, students from the local tech, their spouses. We had forestry, labour gangs, council staff, um, anybody and everybody who we could get to, to make up the numbers really. And at the peak of this, we had 100 people out in the field every day. So here's Andrew, one of the biosecurity team. He's not the tallest chap that works with us, but that's probably one of the biggest plants that we found. The experience around the country was that this is what we were expecting, tall plants that were outside of the canopy of the fodder beet. Um, it might be the south and climate, but we actually found that most of our plants were really small and they were within the canopy of the fodder beet. We had really bad terrain, so this is the best one 
best paddock you could probably imagine. Some of them were like mountainsides, um, lots of weed, um, and the crop in Southland was a lot more dense and a lot fuller coverage, so it made finding them a lot harder than in other places. So here we go, this is a typical one, it's spot the velvet leaf. So at the end of that area, I promise you there is a velvet leaf plant. Um, so Adam was one of our team leader of biosecurity and these guys were, were awesome. They did all the local um, negotiations with the farmers, they, they mentored the teams, they really led the, led the way out in the field. And when they actually farmed one, there was a great feeling of achievement. It became, you know, people really enjoyed doing this. It really brought them all together. If the teams went out for three or four days and didn't find anything, they got pretty despondent, really. <laughs> they wondered what they were doing. And, and there is a velvet leaf just there by her ear, which you can just see. <coughs> Excuse me. So the challenges. Changing goalposts. We started this, we thought we'd got 1,400 hectares. Um, every week we got another list and another thousand hectares to do and by the end we had about four and a half thousand. Um, finance was another one. Um, we, as I say, we took the bull by the horns and we just went for it and after a couple of weeks I said to the, my boss, you better send MPI a bill and I think the bill went and it was like, what the hell are you guys doing down there? So um, there was a little bit of um, I can't remember the night, uh, recalibration of the response, that was the, the direction we got down. Um, so we, after we, we peaked at about 100, we went down to about 60 or 70 people a day. Uh, media, we, you know, local council, local government, you, you interact with your media, you really want to put the message out and get the farmers on board. Um, MPI, national agencies have a different way of doing things, slightly slower to respond, I think. And, and we were on um, Campbell, John Campbell on Radio New Zealand, as he is now, and on TV3. <coughs> and one of the um, tele uh, teleconferences the next day, is we got criticised because everyone was talking about Southland and nobody knew about the rest of the country. So we were driving that ourselves. The other criticism was that Canterbury can do 15 hectares a day per person, and we're only doing three. So from a national point of view, they were, it was trying to explain to them that longer distances, worse terrain, all those reasons I've just gone through, but the, the pressure was, come on guys, get on with this. And um, the weather was absolutely fantastic for six weeks. We had two days of rain. It could have been, um, you know, not doable this really. I'll just whisk through. So um, we used ArcGIS, so all our farms, all our finds, everything was mapped on GIS. You could integrate the pictures and get all the paper documents were scanned into GIS. It was, it really worked very well. Um, we found 199 plants and 1900 staff days in the field. So it's, n it's not to be stiffed at, this was a, a big operation for us. And that's about it. So what do we get out of it? From my point of view, um, really practice my, my operations room. We broke it a few times, which was really good. Um, lots of team spirit, lots of people exposed to civil defence who've never been in the EOC before. Um, and there's lots of planning going on at the moment about foot and mouth. And I think this, the kind of learnings from this kind of thing, which um, I dare I say it, not too serious, nobody died. Um, but it puts us in a much better place moving forward for, for the more serious stuff. That's me. We're moving on straight away, uh, going to the Canterbury recovery and lessons learned. Elizabeth McNaughton is driving the team that uh, noting the lessons uh, out of DPMC. Thank you, Elizabeth. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome to the world of learning and legacy from the Canterbury earthquake recovery. I love to talk about both recovery and innovation. They both push my limits in terms of problem solving 
and creativity. So they're both really delicious things for me to talk about. So David, if I get carried away, pull me back. We have 10 minutes here to cover two really amazing subjects. Hmm? Excellent, excellent. You have permission. Permission is really important for innovation, by the way. Um, I feel like I shouldn't really show and, you know, I should really show and tell this and should sort of be flying around from the ceilings or doing an interpretive dance to really demonstrate the first principles of innovation, which are embracing risk and learning from failure as well. But I'm here to talk about two things briefly. I'll talk about the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Learning and Legacy Program. And if we have a little time, I'll touch on a few innovations from Christchurch, which are really amazing. So we used a design thinking methodology to come up with the program scope that we have. So when I first started this job, I thought, OK, so how do we intentionally learn from disaster recovery? So we had a good nosy around the world at what folks were doing and found out really, actually, we're not so great at learning from disasters. Right, so that was the starting point. So we really thought we don't want to create like this book of learning and recommendations that sits on the shelf, keeping the bookshelf nice and warm but not really achieving anything else. So our program approach is learn, prepare, act. So everything we're doing around this learning program, which is, by the way, system-wide learning. So across the private sector, the public sector, local institutions, community, the nonprofit sector, a whole of recovery learning program, all focused with the endpoint being action and all focused around the end user, which are practitioners. So, in terms of the learning, there are a lot of learning events happening. We are at one here today. So it's about sharing those, making those accessible, pulling together the findings from those learnings. But it's also about preparing. And so it's really neat to see the work that's going on in Wellington. If there's anywhere, it's here. We really need to get prepared in terms of earthquake. So, really look, working with the 100 Resilient Cities program, working with Remo, working with, okay, so here are the learnings. How are you gonna catch those and put them into preparedness for Wellington? And then there's the favorite bit, my favorite bit, the action stuff. So I just wanted to share an example of learning in action right now. So I don't know if some of you may know Brendan Winder, who played a key role in the demolitions work in Christchurch. So quite a lot of effort was put into learning from that program. And Brendan, as we speak, is in Nepal, working with the Nepalis on how to do demolitions and the safety and all of those aspects as we speak. So that's just an example of that learning preparing those tools, checklists, really understanding it, putting it into action in Nepal today. The second question was, well, how do you approach system-wide learning? So we talked with 300 odd folks from across the sectors to really understand, okay, what are the things that are really important to you? What are the things that are as important to Red Cross say as they are to EQC, as they are to whoever? And the, the sort of the five themes that came out that I'd like to share with you and are kind of anchor points for our learning. So it's understanding the recovery co uh, context, right? We don't, a lot of people, we have to stand up and lead in this environment, but we actually don't understand the phases of recovery or understand sort of the psychosocial landscape of recovery. Um, these leadership and governance, hugely important. Resource allocations, how do you make some of the tough trade-offs and decisions? Communication and community engagement, and also the conditions for innovation. So we have a website coming to you soon, EQ Recovery Learning, and so this is a platform that will we'll share experiences, tools, learning materials, but this will only be as successful as it will only be successful if we get really great content from across that system. So 
this is just a shout out to you all that we, you know, if you have been working in the Canterbury context and have done a reflection piece, have done some learning, to get in touch with us so that we can share that with New Zealand, but also there's a lot of international interest as well. So oh, you'll be able to search by theme, by topic, by recovery environment, all sorts of things. So send us your content, please. Because your, our learning is a gift. It's a gift to others navigating this tough path of recovery. I just want to talk a little bit about the chemistry of circumstance. So post-disaster, I mean, it's change on a truly massive scale. There's not, you know, we don't see change like this really anywhere else. The trajectory of life is disrupted. That uncertainty. It in turn leads us to question. We question everything after an event like this. Personally, we question ourselves, our faith, our ability to cope. What do we need? What do we want our cities to be like? What kind of life? What kind of services? You know, all of this questioning is actually leading to amazing idea generation. It's also into this test tube, into this chemi chemistry, comes a higher tolerance of risk and a sense of urgency, and also a sense of, of common meaning, that noble purpose, we need to get stuff done, and that attitude. So all of this lead, leads to a really unique innovation environment. Here, the noble purpose that we share, and here being more open to ideas from different places and people. We bump and work with people in, from different sectors and that really creates more of that chemistry. We innovate because we have to. And here is just a little bit again that the, the, the need to innovate remains high but over time the pressure to return to business as usual increases. So our risk tolerance, you know, we have a, a diminishing appetite for risk and this can, this can have a sort of a negative impact on innovation over time throughout a recovery. So just a couple of examples, there are so many examples I could really go on until after dinner, I won't. Um, so just to give you a, a sense of, of a few things, we had the wage subsidy scheme after uh, Canterbury, that you know that was up and running in six days following the earthquake and it had such a positive economic and social impact and kept small businesses alive and kept people in employment. We've had the All Right campaign, I don't know if any of you have had much experience with this but it delights, right? And it is such a great tool, public messaging campaign for really addressing and supporting the psychosocial needs of Canterbury. I really encourage you to have a YouTube search for that. I love the Pack and Save one where the symphony orchestra turns up, so check it out. So why am I so passionate about learning lessons? My career quite literally has been a series of disasters all over the place. But the frustrating thing is, and it really gets me going, is that each one we start from scratch in terms of recovery. You know, we, we start from that same place and then it really, it's tough for people, it really kind of breaks people, you know, we have to push so hard so fast and we're not taking often the benefit of many other events that have preceded it. And what I'm thinking, and, and is that, you know, and listening, listening to some of the other presentations, is that actually the, quick, the better we can learn from events, we can embed that learning and that we can adapt and be agile, that is a real key factor for resilience moving forward, especially as we face more and more complex challenges, both here and in a globalised world. Learning, I say, is a really key thing to resilience done well. So, Superman is so 70s and so small, Will. The world has changed and we're in Avenger territory now. So we need to come together on our learning. We need to create the perfect learning storm so we can really increase 
our ability to tackle the challenges of our future. So thank you very much, and please check out the website, any content, bring it our way. Thank you very much. Thank you.